God designed us for life, an abundant life with him and with one another. But there's a problem. Someone has taken our life. Jesus said the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. We're missing out on life like God intended because we go looking for life in all the wrong places. But there is a solution to this problem. Jesus said he came so that we may have life and have it in abundance. That's why Cross United Church exists, to help people find life like God intended. We believe life like God intended happens when three things are united in our lives. When we're brought to God in wholehearted worship through the cross of Jesus Christ, when we're brought together in authentic community, when we're deployed on the joyful mission that God has for us in the world, we experience fullness of life. Life like God intended, united in wholehearted worship, authentic community, and joyful mission is why Cross United Church exists. Hey, Cross United, it's Pastor Danny. I'm so glad you've joined us for this online message. We're going to be in John 14, 28 through 31. We're going to be talking about how to love Jesus without being a weirdo. While you're turning there or tapping in your Bible or your app, I want to remind you, you can go to crossunited.org. There at crossunited.org, there are two spots where you can click. The top left-hand side of the menu bar takes you to our online check-in digital connection card. We'd love to connect with you, get to know you a little bit better, also to know how we could be praying for you. Also there on the top right-hand side of the menu bar is our giving tab. If you consider Cross United your church home, or if you just consider yourself a generous person, we encourage you to give uh, to our church and through our church. Want to remind you, ladies, there is still time for you to get signed up for the Ladies Bible Study Tuesday mornings in person at 9 a.m. Tuesday evenings on Zoom at 7.15 p.m. Finally, we are going to be relaunching our student ministry, and we're going to be having an interest meeting for our student ministry on May 7th, Friday, May 7th. So mark your calendars. If you have a a, a child who's going to be moving from fifth grade into sixth grade into middle school or a middle school or high school aged child or student, you are welcome and encouraged to attend. It's always interesting to me when I see what people want to advertise on their vehicles and what kind of stickers and, and, and information they put on their vehicles. Now, if you look at the back of our vehicles, um, we'll usually have any number of things on there. We'll have a firefighter union shield on our vehicle with uh, my, my brother-in-law's a firefighter. We want to support him and also hopefully get out of some tickets that we might not have otherwise gotten out of. We also have the Lighthouse Point resident sticker on our vehicles. And uh, you may see a sort of blob of blue that is actually the outline of Lake Tahoe. We have information about our kids' school on the back of our vehicle. These are things, you know, that we want to say, uh, these are things that are important to us. And people put all sorts of different bumper stickers on their car. And for a long time, it's not as common now. You still see it sometimes. People would put, Christians would put, a silver shape of a fish, a Jesus fish, on their vehicle to let people know that they were a follower of Jesus, a fisher of men, a, a someone who uh, was was claiming the name of Christ. At around the same time, there was this proliferation of Christian bumper stickers, and some of these are just wild to me now. And and maybe you've seen some of these even recently, like warning in case of rapture, this car will be unmanned, or my boss is a Jewish carpenter. Honk if you love Jesus. Do you follow Jesus this closely? And then this one that always gets me. Real men love Jesus. Real men love Jesus. That, that always sounded a little bit weird to me when I was a kid and even now. Because it almost sounds like, like Jesus is my boyfriend kind of thing. But we also know that Christians are supposed to, called to, commanded to love Jesus. Jesus. So what does it mean to love Jesus? How can we love Jesus without sounding like and being a weirdo? That's what we're going to talk about today. How to love Jesus. But before we talk about that, we need to talk about two sort of preliminary things. The first thing is briefly, we have to talk about what love actually is. And then secondly, to talk about whether or not Jesus is worthy of our love. First, what is love? What is love? You know, often we think of love 
as an emotion, some sort of feeling that we have. Now, that's part of it. But when we look at what the scripture says, we see that by, the Bible describes love in terms of who God is and what God does. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 8, that God is love in his nature, his triune nature, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a father loving his son in the fellowship of love of the Holy Spirit, one God in three persons. And we see in one of the most famous verses of the Bible, John 3, 16, God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. So love is who God is, and love is what God does. Now, the Bible also says that God is good and he does good. And I think we put these things together, we see that that love is God desiring for us the greatest good. Eternal life is life with God, the greatest good. God desires a relationship with us. The greatest good anyone could ever have is God himself. The greatest good anyone could ever attain is a relationship with God. Love is desiring someone's greatest good, ultimately, that that person would know God, who is the greatest good. Now, the second question is, is Jesus worthy of love? Is Jesus worthy of love? Now, it sounds strange to ask this question. Is Jesus worthy of the greatest good? We, we have to understand that, that Jesus is both fully God, John 1.1, 1, 1, the, the Word was God, and fully human, John 1.14, in the Word who was God became flesh and lived among us. As the eternal God, Jesus is the greatest good, and as the perfect man, Jesus deserves the greatest good, a relationship with God. So does Jesus worthy of love? Is he worthy of us longing for him to have the greatest good and be the greatest good? Is to be seen and shown for who he truly is and what he has done? Is Jesus truly God and truly perfect man? Yes. So is he worthy of our love? Yes, absolutely. So what does it mean to love him? Well, he tells us in John 14. Look there at verse 28. You have heard me tell you, I am going away and I am coming to you. If you love me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you may believe. I will not talk with you much longer because the ruler of the world is coming. He has no power over me. On the contrary, so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do as the Father commanded me. Get up, let's leave this place. Now, Jesus is saying this in the context of his final evening with his friends and his followers. He's just said to them, if you missed our Easter message, you can go on our website, YouTube, or Facebook channels, that we talked about the peace Jesus offers. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. It, they, he's, he's wanting his disciples to be comforted and to have his peace, not as the world gives, and to not let their hearts be troubled or afraid. Now he's, he's saying this. He's saying, what does it mean to truly love Jesus? And I think we see four implications here. Number one, rejoice for Jesus. Look at verse 28. You have heard me tell you, I am going away and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. It's kind of weird to think about rejoicing for Jesus, but that's exactly what Jesus tells us to do here. He says he will go away and he will return. Now he says this, this is a twofold movement. First, he's going to go away in his crucifixion and return in his resurrection. He's going to die on the cross for sin so that anyone who will turn from their sin and trust in him will be forgiven of their sin and given eternal life. And he will be raised from the dead so that if we believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord and confess with our mouth that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. He's going to go and he's going to return. And then he's going to go and return in a second way. He's going to go in terms of his ascension to, to ascend to the right hand of the Father and then will one day, which we're still awaiting, he will return for his people to make all things new. And he says, if you loved me, you would rejoice 
that I go to the Father because the Father is greater than I am. We should have joy in Jesus' delight in the Father. Now, he says something interesting here that's been the source of a lot of confusion and misunderstanding over the years. He says the Father is greater than I. He says the Father is greater than I. Some have misinterpreted this to mean that Jesus is somehow less God, less fully divine, a secondary being to the Father. That, though, is not what Jesus is saying. We have to understand how to read the Bible correctly. We have to understand how to rightly interpret the Scripture. Because we can do justice and do the, the, uh, explain the, the, the words of the Scripture, but we can violate the meaning of the Scripture. What we see when we look in the Scripture is that Jesus is one person, God the Son, who has taken a human nature so that he is fully God and fully human. So that some things the Bible says are said according to the divine nature of Jesus. The word was God, John 1.1. 1, 1. That he and the Father are one, John 10.30. And some things are said according to the human nature of Jesus. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1.14. Here, John 14.28, the Father is greater than I am. We have to understand how to rightly interpret the Bible. We have to understand the context of Scripture. We have to understand other verses in Scripture and use Scripture to interpret Scripture, or we're going to make wrong conclusions about what Scripture is actually teaching. We have to be aware of the historic summaries of Christian faith, like the Nicene Creed, which outlines the doctrine of the Trinity, and the Chalcedonian definition, which outlines the doctrine of Jesus Christ's hypostatic union, that he is one person with two natures. These are foundational Christian teachings that the Bible teaches that have been summarized for us in these statements of faith. These statements of faith are not infallible. They are not inerrant like the scripture. They are not perfect, but they're sort of like when you're driving on 95 and you're maybe losing a little bit of your focus and you drift off to the edge and the shoulder of the road. Those ground up rumble strips that go zzz and awaken you to the fact that you're drifting from the, where you're supposed to be. This is what these, these, these statements of faith do. They remind us that we're going the wrong direction. Now, only Scripture is the final authority of truth, only infallible and errant standard, but we must understand the Scripture, and sometimes these sorts of things can be helpful to remind us not to interpret Scripture the wrong way so that we can, like Jesus says, rejoice with Him. That's the first way, to rejoice with him that he is going to the Father, that in his human nature he will ascend to the Father and be exalted as the fully divine, fully human Messiah and King. Second way we love Jesus. Believe in Jesus. I have told you now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you may believe. This was the test of authenticity for an Old Testament prophet. Did the prophet's predictions come true? If a prophet's predictions do not come true, you can be sure that that prophet does not speak for God. But Jesus' predictions about his crucifixion, burial, and resurrection came true. His predictions about building his church, the church spread throughout the world, have, has been coming true for, for 20 centuries. All of the nations being discipled and brought into Christ is coming true in and through the mission of the church. Jesus' words have proven true over and over and over so that we may love him by believing in him. The third way we love Jesus, stand in Jesus. He says, I will not talk with you much longer because the ruler of the world is coming. He has no power over me. You know, Satan, the enemy, is strong and he's powerful. But he's not as strong and he's not as powerful as King Jesus. Jesus says he has no power over me. He is coming, but he will not win. He says this over and over. For example, John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of the world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. John 16, 11, The ruler of the world has been judged. In the cross, Colossians 2.15, Christ disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. 
When Jesus says he has no power over me, he's literally saying he has nothing in me. And scholars note that that is a way to say he has no claim or authority on me because I have no sin. I have no skeletons in my closet. There's no opposition research. There's no superhero flaw. There is no kryptonite. I am unassailable. I am perfectly sinless. And Satan has no claim on me because the only power that Satan has is the power of death. And the only power of death comes from the power of sin. And I have no part in sin. Look at what Hebrews 2.14 2.14 says, Now since the flesh, the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these, so that through his death, he might destroy the one holding the power of death, that is the devil. So you see there, Satan's power comes from his power and death, and death comes through sin. So if Jesus did not sin, he does not have the, the, Satan does not have the ability to lay claim on Jesus. So what Jesus did when he went to the cross is he used Satan's own weapon against him, and he defeated him. He triumphed over him in his crucifixion. Satan thought it was a victory, but it was Satan's final, ultimate defeat. And what he calls us to do, Jesus does, is in Christ with our sins washed away, not because of our righteousness, but because of his, we have spiritual authority and power in Christ. To love Jesus is to stand in Jesus. Fourth and finally, witness with Jesus. On the contrary, so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do as the Father commanded me. Get up. Let's leave this place. Jesus obeys the Father in his human nature. In the fact, insofar as he is a man, a human being, he obeys the Father and does what the Father said. As the divine Son, he's sent in the world, he takes a human nature, and in his human nature, he obeys the Father. He is fully, equally God with the Father in his divine nature. In his human nature, he obeys and submits to the Father. And in doing that, displays to the world the glory of God and displays to the world his love for the Father and displays to the world the gospel, witnessing to the world that the world may know, that the world may know. And he calls us to witness with him to what he has done in our lives. He is calling us to witness to the life, death, burial, and resurrection. He's calling us to invite friends, to invite family into relationship with us and with Christ, with the church. And he's calling us and sending us to be missionaries, whether in our neighborhoods or to the nations. Witness with Jesus. So what now? So what now? First, I think we need to remember to learn to read the Bible correctly. We need to be involved in Bible studies that teach us how to properly approach the Scripture. We need to access resources. We have on our book table at Cross United the book Grasping God's Word, which is a basic text of hermeneutics, how the art and science of biblical interpretation. So many Christians go wrong because they don't know how to properly interpret the Bible. They read the Bible. It doesn't make sense to them. And when it does make sense, they make wrong conclusions because they don't understand the proper way to interpret the scripture. We must learn how to read the Bible correctly. I want to invite you into that. If, if you want to do that, we have resources for you to take that next step to begin the journey of interpreting the Bible correctly and knowing what God has said through his word. So what now? Number two, trust in Christ today. Repent and believe in the gospel. Become a real and genuine Christian, not a crino, a Christian in name only. Become a real follower of Jesus that you don't just say it with your mouth, but you live it with your life. You don't just think it in your head, you believe it in your heart where you believe the right things and you feel the right things and you do the right things because you are a new creation in Christ. Turn from your sin and trust in Jesus Christ and he will forgive your sin and he will give you eternal life. Third, 
stand in Christ by pursuing personal holiness. The, the warfare of in the spiritual realm is about our personal sanctification. It is about reducing the claim that Satan can hold over our heads because of our growth in the likeness, the likeness of Christ. Now, in Christ we are forgiven, we are clean. He has no claim on us. He has no ultimate authority over us because he has no power of death because our sin has been washed away. But our own experience of spiritual power or spiritual impotence is greatly affected by whether or not we're walking in holiness. So repent of your sin. Be accountable. Confess. Find a friend who you trust that you can tell, hey, I'm struggling with pornography. Hey, I'm struggling with drinking too much at night after my kids are in bed. Hey, I'm working way more than I should. My wife and I are fighting like cats and dogs. Whatever it is, confess, repent, believe, and be free. Fourth and finally, witness to a friend. Invite them to church. Just take the risk to say what you believe. Say, you know what? God has made a huge impact in my life. Jesus has changed me. I would love for you to come to church with me. Just open that side of the conversation. They, there may be spiritual conversations and gospel conversations that person is ready and willing to have, but you just have never opened the door to those rooms in their heart. Learn to love Jesus because he first loved us. There's a Christian pastor named Andrew Brunson who was a minister in Turkey for many years. And um, when, when there was a failed military coup, uh, the government cracked down on journalists, um, military leaders, activists, religious leaders, and, and Pastor Brunson was called a spy and put in prison. And he was in prison for a long time. And finally, through the, the government getting involved, American government getting involved and putting pressure on the, the Turkish government, he was released from prison. And he, he gave a talk at a, in a chapel message a couple of years ago. And, and this is what he said. He says, There are some who go into the valley of testing and do not make it out. I was broken. I lay there alone in my solitary cell. I had great fear terrible grief and I was weeping and the thought kept going through my mind where are you God why are you so far away and I opened my mouth as I wept aloud and as I was surprised at what I heard coming out of my mouth I heard I love you Jesus I love you Jesus I love you Jesus God loved the world in this way that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And this is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and gave his son. God is love, and he loves us so that we can in turn love him. Will you learn to love Jesus? <laughs>